Time to start. Yes, Rimshe, thank you so much. Thank you so, so much for joining this session. We're so privileged and honoured to have you as our special guest. And um, this is a very special day for us because it's the anniversary of Jamming King Siwampo. And it's a rare treat to have an emanation of Jamming King Siwampo here with us today. to give us the transmission of this special Guru Yoga that we published today in our reading room. So Rimshe, welcome. Um, it's lovely to see you. And I'm going to hand over to you straight away uh, to do the, to give the lung of the text. Okay, so um, I suppose good morning or good afternoon, good day to Uh, wherever you may be. And uh, I would like to thank you all for giving me this opportunity to uh, read uh, Kinsumpo's uh, Guru Yoga. Um, I think it's called Yeshe uh, Chokzo in English, the bestower of supreme wisdom. Uh, <clears throat> so I'll just um, go straight into it. Um, <音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音
Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, they have offered their um, entire being activity as a way of uh, making us sentient beings free from suffering and cause of suffering like themselves. As many of you might have read in the Bodhichaya Avatara, in the aspiration uh, chapter where the Bodhisattvas make aspirations, where, where Shantideva uh, offers us the, the idea of how to make ourselves useful for sentient beings, where it says, if, if a sentient being needs a bridge, may I be a bridge. If a sentient being needs a breeze, may I be a breeze. So <clears throat> here, uh, this Guru Yoga is really using the Guru as a means, as a path to become um, exactly the same as the Guru, Lamina Jayeshin Chokso. So here, Lama, of course, means uh, guru in, in Sanskrit. So using the guru's activities, uh, appearance, um, using how the guru's activities, appearances, affects us as a way of um, as a way of um, rousing in us sublime wisdom. Of course, all of us are very uh, eager to know, as we can see, whether it is on the news or all of the social media, all of us are so eager to know what is happening to everyone, whether our neighbor is um, sleeping well, walking around, why are they walking around in this way? Why are they banging around? Why is this neighbor doing this or that? Why is the president of this country doing this or not? We are so eager <clears throat> to know, but we are not very um, able to choose what to know. We're simply happy to know. I suppose that is why these social medias are so popular, because knowing is something we all want to do. <clears throat> Basically, we can't mind our own business and want to know what absolutely everyone is doing. So that kind of knowing wisdom is not what we're seeking here. That is why I think this one is called also the supreme wisdom, wisdom that actually can uh, deliver us from uh, the cause of suffering and through that suffering itself basically something that can deliver ourselves from our own uh, imprisoning um, conceptual world emotional world physical world to be free from that I think this is what we can say that this Guru Yoga is called so that is why in the text it says, um, with the wish <clears throat> to, to become free or with the wish to extract oneself. Of course, here meaning suffering and truth of cause of suffering. And with the wish to become awakened then um, 
by understanding our um, connection, our uh, wish to, to know what the Guru is really with respect and with um, appreciation to the Guru, or using that, understanding that to be the very base, the very life of the path, then to get accustomed to using this path, getting accustomed to or to meditating on. And he says here, this is the uh, swift path of Vajrayana. And so, uh, so to do it in brief, there is three parts to it. The preparation, the actual path, practice, actual thing that we need to get accustomed to, to, you, to, to practice, and then the conclusion. So the second one, the next part, the sorry, the, the preparation is the good, the taking refuge and uh, the bodhicitta. Um, then it's, uh, the text says here to repeat that three times. Of course, it says here three times. It does. It isn't limited to three times. It doesn't have to be three times. It can be once if that if that is enough to connect us uh, to the the very uh, reason for taking refuge in bodhicitta is <clears throat> present. Then we don't need to repeat it three times. If not, um, we might have to repeat it many more than three times, just so that we, our uh, mind stream is slightly affected, touched, moved. That's why he says here, three times, etc., as much as one is capable of. And through that, to train one's mind, training it to do what? Training it to understanding um, what this path is about. It is about becoming free. It is about becoming free from our own um, points of view, our own narrow-mindedness, our own fear, our own um, craving our own um, uh, grasping to our own sense of um, I that binds us from becoming able to allow this wisdom to to manifest. So. That is the idea of training one's mind. So training one's mind in understanding the Buddha as a guide, the Dharma as a path, and the Sangha as a support, and to really wishing that, to really making it so that that is our mind wants. For many of us, while we're taking refuge, while one is actually taking refuge, we might be wondering, why is my neighbor making such noise? Why is my friend not answering to me? Etc., etc. If those thoughts are there, then um, there and that they can pull us away, then we definitely need to train our mind. Somehow, we are very much like a, a very a lively, curious dog that we are walking with. And it's sniffing everything on the path. And then it gets run over by 
by a bigger dog or by a cat or whatever it is. Well, that means that we need training. So that's why he mentions here saying that repeat this three times or as many times as necessary so that our mind has that discipline, has that discipline into discipline into actually wanting to go there without the fear of thinking, oh, three times is too much, 21 times is far too much, 100 times, what am I, you know, what am I, don't I have anything else to do? This is too much, that practice is demanding too much. All of these things are really <laughs> what we're needing to, um, to work with, to tame our mind, especially the bodhicitta. So, for for the refuge in bodhicitta, we need to remind ourselves that um, we want to be free from certain things, and that is why we're taking refuge. Um, it's not just some kind of optional things that we are ticking so that we can buy something, and it is also not some kind of um, obligation that somebody is putting on me. Sometimes when we're doing our practices, we think, oh, this is the refuge, we have to do it. And we might, we are happy to do it in a certain sense, but deep down we, we have some kind of reticence and some kind of resentment of having to do this. This is really the idea of training one's mind. And then, <clears throat> in order to use the guru as a uh, as a path, the guru's activities, the even our devotion to the guru, thinking of that guru, even our appreciation of the guru, the, whether it is the form or the, the feeling that we have, all of these are part of the guru yoga, using the guru as a path. <coughs> so then the next part, as it is said in English, um, is... Uh, recite the Sri Tamasana's main part practice. The second has four sections. First, visualize the basis for the accumulation. Number two, Number <laughs> So that was um, the visualization of the support of our accumulation of merit. It is, of course, um, important to remember that um, the entire path to awakening can be summarized into accumulation of merit and cleansing of obscurations. So here, in order to accumulate merit, then we need uh, a support for it. Um, for us um, sentient beings who need uh, references, who need a location, who need geo-positioning of things, then we need this. If we are completely free from that, without any, then we probably don't need this. We are free from dualistic uh, <clears throat> insecurities, then we don't need this. But as we do, we all like to know who is in front, who is in the back, where one, where one is with our relation to someone, um, we have relation to some place, we all need something. That need that we have suggests that we actually um, somehow are 
are stuck to it. We can't be without it. We can't live without it. So therefore, we have that vulnerability. And using that as a support, then we visualize in front of us, or rather we place in the forefront of our mind the uh, support for us to accumulate merit. So that's why we visualize um, here the guru in the form of um, inseparable from all the Buddhas in front of us. Um, as the text says, within the state of emptiness, there is no world, no being, subject or object, perceived, etc. So, in order to to do this, then um, lost. In order to do this, then it starts with that uh, word in Sanskrit, Om Shunyata Dhyanabhanda Swabhava Atmako. So, this, the reason why this is done is that we have at this moment a, a very strong um, affiliation, a very strong uh, need for need or want for things that we experience to, to feel real. And that is what we all use all the time. That is what we call the grasping. And as long as that is <clears throat> present, then as long as that strong grasping to our perceptions, our experiences of our body, our emotions, and our uh, the way we think, as long as that is really there, then again, using the Guru Yoga is only going to take us just further and deeper into our own um, habits, experiences. So we first need to acknowledge our uh, vulnerability to this perception to which we are so attached. And so the word here, Mashunya Danyan Patasovat Magoham, is suggesting that all of this is one's own perception. And that, that that perception that we are experiencing is nothing but that. That it is not um so real and important as we think it is. Right now, we are looking at, each of us are looking at our screen, and then the screen looks and feels so real to us. But if an ant would be walking on the screen, what would the ant be experiencing? How real is it? How solid is it? Is the ant's perception of it less real than ours? If somebody with X-ray vision could see the screen, what would that be? So 
basically, it's important to understand that this is just another perception that those animals are experiencing and ours, just another perception. If I'm looking at my screen, the way I see my screen and somebody else sees my screen is again different. So that which I am actually grasping at and the solidity that I give to that grasping is just my own perception. And beyond that, it doesn't have any other ex existence. That is what this text is suggesting. That's why it says here, within the state of emptiness, there is no world or being, no subject or object to be perceived. Beyond the simple experiences that we are going through, which is, of course, undeniable, we're experiencing it. But beyond that experience, that perception, there is nothing more than that. But we definitely project something more than that. <clears throat> so, here, the key word is our grasping to that appearance is actually nothing but our grasping. Just like somebody wearing a lion's mask or tiger's mask and feeling that they are like a tiger, but it is nothing but a paper tiger. And so uh, in this part, um, where it says from the arising of the various experiences of samsara and in this palace, this place, the secret palace of Akanishta, in front of us that we are making, um, here, we are really making this place into something so vast, beautiful. That's why in the sky before me, amidst clouds of enchanting offering, offerings, there's a jeweled lion throne, etc., etc. And then, in there, is the Vajradhara who upholds the three vows, the universal sovereign of the enlightened families. And here, even though in the text it doesn't spe specify that one should see oneself as anything specific, but <clears throat> it is nonetheless <clears throat> um, <clears throat> evident to us that we are grasping to ourselves as something. That which we are grasping to us to ourselves as, does that have um, an impact or not? If it has, then if we're using the guru as a path, why shouldn't we use ourselves as a path? Within that, seeing within the path, what is there to remove and what is there to to um, to, to make apparent, to make manifest, so that we can engage in that. <clears throat> so, um, when all our perception, appearances that we experience, when we dissolve the grasping to that, then instead of continuing grasping to ourselves as ordinary Joe, or uh, I don't know the feminine version Pam, as part of that, but whatever that is, instead of grasping to ourselves that, that then we're using, we can see ourselves as Vajyogini. And then, <clears throat> Um, in front of this 
ourselves as by Jukini, then we make uh, this palace beautiful. So this is actually part of the accumulation of merit, putting that effort, seeing this place as beautiful, just like we would if we invited I mean, Ken Sumpu, into our own home. How would we arrange it? We would at least remove the empty bottles, uh, the shoes and underwear that we have thrown around everywhere. At least clean up that. That is already part of accumulation of merit. And here, it's doing that in our mind. So you can imagine flowers, banners, <clears throat> tablecloths, sheets, covering um, every surface. That part of, of that part is really the offering of our devotion, joy, enthusiasm, diligence, etc. And then seeing the guru, Jankinzumbo. On a, on a uh, text say on, on mattresses and um, on cushions. Um, usually, this is uh, um, it is customary to use that uh, for for gurus when they're alive, and then if they have passed away, then to visualize them on lotus, sun and moon disc, etc. But here, another part of the guru yoga is really to do whatever is uh, easier for us to to have a devotion to. And as this text was written by Chang Kins Wombo for, for, uh, for his disciple who knew, who, uh, who knew him while he was alive. So then the idea of having him just as he is used to seeing him. <clears throat> and also, um, um, Sometimes we see the guru in the form of Vajrasattva, Guru Rinpoche, um, Vajra, etc. But that is in order that we can um, transcend our grasping to the guru as ordinary. But at the same time, if for us, if we are able to connect with the guru in whatever form we met them met with or whatever form brings us an ease of developing devotion then that form is also fine so that is why here is in the form that the recipient knew of so um, in that form. And um, to understand, to know that um, I'm on the mission. I'm on the mission. I'm on the mission. I'm the 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 And um, when we say he's the essence of the three worlds, three jewels, he's inseparable from the three kayas. Just the thought of him dispels all fear of samsara and nirvana. And he vividly appears as the embodiment of all refuges. Every hall of that Jami Kinze Wongo we should think that in every single pore of his body, there is the, there is all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, all the mandalas of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are present in 
every pore of this Jamie Kins wall. And that his speech also is the essence of all the teachings. And that his mind, this non conceptual wisdom mind, is again the same as all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. To really think of that, that is also part of the Guru Yoga. And to really feel that just this mere sight of Yami Kinsungbo's face could completely sever all our um, conceptual grasping and just feeling his gaze on us can completely change our all, our entire atmosphere. And that just simply thinking of us will force wisdom to arise in us. And just by thinking of the Guru of Jankin Womb, that the compassionate power effortlessly flows or powerlessly flows. He has no choice but to let his compassion flow if we think of him, when we think of him. So that is what we need to think of when we, once we are visualized and making the over there. The appearance, you can see it in many of the photo images of Jin Umbo. And <clears throat> visualizing the guru in this way, thinking of the guru in this way, is actually part of mingling one's mind with the guru in introducing the guru's appearance, qualities in our mind. So that is already an aspect of mingling one's mind inseparably with the guru. And then, now in front of that, what do we do? We could just sit there. You could just think of Jami Kins Rungpo in front, check your uh, Instagram account, and see whether somebody is liking us or not, or if somebody is threatening us, if somebody is, um, what is it, um, uh, making any... Uh, comments about how we look that's also you could do that and uh, that that would definitely ensure that our, um, our stay in the cycle of existence is secured so these are I suppose the opposite of this uh, seven branch offerings or if there is a slight wish or slight hint that we, we might want to, we might possibly want to want to be free from samsara, then there is the seven branch of things. Paying homage, where we are ready to pay homage with our entire being, body, speech, mind. Not just making our place beautiful with our imagination, but like even now, we might, maybe we have made our room clean to make the, uh, to do this practice. But our mind, visualize, Visualizing the place, visualizing the 
offerings, visualizing ourselves as we are or as Vajrayogini. That already costs us so much. Like when we finish, we might think, oh, phew, I finished my practice. These are <clears throat> um, these are things that happen, but this is what we have to do in training. Not only that, not only thinking of ourselves making these offerings, but making more of ourselves, visualizing another, I suppose you could call it clone of ourselves, and then a clone of a clone and a clone of a clone. And all of them making offerings to the Guru, paying homage with our speech and with our mind, feeling, training, and having this devotion, appreciation, respect. That is the paying homage part. Like in general, in our usual world, when you see someone, unless you want to, to fight them or break up with them, you see them with smile, you say something nice, and then hopefully you're also thinking something nice. This is how we usually relate. So this is actually how to use our ordinary way as a path, turning it into the path. And then making offerings of whatever we have. And then visualizing and then visualizing multiple ourselves, making offerings that can fill the universe in our mind. And then again, each of them making as many of them. That is the idea of Samantapatra offerings. And the next part, um, and on um, also um, another part of the um, accumulation of merit is. Usually it's called um, confession, but this can also be seen as an offering where we are completely open, not hiding anything, <clears throat> completely opening ourselves and especially open to changing <clears throat> the way we look at our actions of the body, speech, mind, feeling fully, totally exposing ourselves to ourselves and, of course, here to Indomitian And then even more than that, being open to changing that. Because other than outside of that, again, Guru Yoga is not possible. Ah, is not possible. So please don't think of confession as something um, uncomfortable, something lowly, something that we shouldn't do. Confession is really about being open, being fearless about ourselves, and especially being fearless to changing that. <clears throat> especially to the idea of never re-engaging in deluded views, deluded conduct, 
of engaging in negative actions. And then, after that, rejoicing um, in the activities, of course, of all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, especially here of Jamichin Zewombo, by giving teachings, and benefiting sentient beings, rejoicing in all of that, and requesting teachings, requesting for those bodhisattvas and our teachers to not um, cease their activities as it is now, continue manifesting, and then dedicating all our merit. But these, you know all of this, and you can, of course, receive these um, instructions by reading or from other teachers. Um, so then, in front of that, then what do we do? Fervently, um, So before that, she chatting So during these seven branch, you can do prostrations, make mandala offerings. So and then now the third part, which is um, praying one pointedly. In Tibetan, the word puchuk um, is it uh, refers to purpa. Mm, it's like a, a peg that you uh, you 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 drive in very deep so that it doesn't move. So so a puchuk so. Making this aspiration, supplication, so that our devotion <clears throat> can peg us deep into the activities of the Guru. I suppose that is something that we can use, we can say. So... In order to do that, why by driving the uh, the peg? of um, our thinking of the Guru, our one-pointedness of thinking of the Guru through the devotion, through the yearning, so that it can uh, It can break open the compassion, the aspiration of our guru. Basically, this is, I think, what Prutsuk um, means. <clears throat> Without that kind of deep yearning, or rather being touched by the guru, instead of thinking yearning, devotion, but without being deeply touched 
by the Guru. Whatever kind of prayers that we make and accumulations we do. Um, it is really, it is said that it is like um, <clears throat> it's like dyeing a cloth without putting the ingredients that actually uh, makes the cloth hold the dye. So this feeling, this being touched, this openness, this vulnerability that we deep we have deep down needs to be exposed and that is really the idea of devotion if we can do that then even if the effort isn't as much even if we don't recite as much or do so much effort the result will be there so it's really whether we are able to have this openness, this, um, this ability to not um, insulate ourselves from the devotion, from being touched by the Guru. Um, again, I'm, I'm quoting um, where he says, the way to, um, to um, <clears throat> be or to follow a teacher is through um, through being, through devotion, or through um, through being open through being touched it is not just through um, what is it called through um, being well manned again the way to accomplish the guru is again devotion being touched not just praying <clears throat> if we have that devotion, that respect, that being touched by the Guru, then whatever we do, the blessings will enter us. Without this devotion, being touched by the Guru, then whatever we do, it won't have that effect. In general, you know, we have the fortune of having uh, being inspired by our gurus, by Jain Kinsewongbo, Lodra. For example, when we see images of Jain Kinsewongbo, Lodra, of Jain Kinsewongbo, and for example, Sai Kinsewongbo, all our teachers. We have some kind of inspiration. And also we might feel certain gratitude towards them. But if this cannot be something that is sustained and that it actually hasn't pervaded beyond the surface of our mind, then also the blessings will be bad. It's like if we are sowing some seeds, if you've only put it on the surface, then you will get the result of the surface. If you put it deep enough, then it will take root. It won't be taken by birds or taken and uh, dug in by other animals. So it needs to withstand this devotion, appreciation, 
of the guru feeling this gratitude needs to withstand the what is it called the frost birds etc of distraction um of uh, the eight worldly concerns to the point that um where most of our thoughts are hovering around the, the activities of the gurus. That is why, you know, reading the biographies are something that we are encouraged to do. And therefore, also, our main activity is devotion. To the point that we are not so distracted by the other eight worldly concerns. And to the point that the thought of the Guru can dispel our fears, insecurities. Like Ding Ling Ba said, at the time of, even if we are about to die, even if the entire world is about to fall apart, if this devotion is there, then this is the sublime method. Amongst all tools or methods, this is the most powerful thing. So, developing this openness, this appreciation to the Guru, being able to allow ourselves to be touched so even just thinking oh my teacher is quite good very kind on its own is not enough for many aspects, we need to be able to uh, make our mind be touched, become tender to the activities of the group. So, in here, the, uh, the text says, Jamba Yang so Seche Gyakun Je Kinsen Nube Ye Shi Jig Duba. To the glorious Lama, Lord of scholars and siddhas, the sole embodiment of the wisdom of knowledge, love and power of all the victors along with their heirs, Manjagosha and others. In the depth of my heart, I pray, grant your blessings. So, thinking of the Guru as the sole embodiment of wisdom, knowledge, love, power of Manjagoj and all the other Buddhas and Bodhisattvas to the victor along with the, to this, um, the glorious Lama, Lord of all scholars and siddhas. Lord of all scholars, that's to mean that this guru has knowledge, wisdom. Not only does he have wisdom, the know-how, but he has also got the experience. That is why the scholar and uh, siddhas is put in here without the know-how. If, like, if we needed to go to some place, we don't know those that place. Don't know how to get there, what it might be. Then um, we will get lost. And if we have a have a a guide that knows how to get there. That's already half the 
thing done. And if we have a, a guide that has been there, that is the idea of the Siddhas, then that can be a guide that is infallible, that can get to that place. So that's why he says here, the glorious Lord of scholars and Siddhas. So this is about knowing their qualities, knowing the qualities of the Guru. And the qualities of the Guru here, why is there um, the, the notion of um, what is it, Manjushri and the others? Even if Manjushri, the Buddhas, Bodhisattvas were here right now, what would they actually be able to tell us? Nothing more than what Jankin Zumbo has shown here on the path in this, this Guru Yoga. So that's why the Lord of all scholars and siddhas, the victors of all the victors and with their heir, Manjagosha and others, you have, you are the sole embodiment of the wisdom, the knowledge, love and power Even if Manju Gosha in person was here teaching us, apart from what Nikin Swampu has just explained in this Guru Yoga, there's nothing more that we can learn from there, more we can do. Even if the Buddha of compassion, Janresik, was here. What more? Um, how much more compassionate would Genesis be? How much more, more the compassion of Genesis would be more potent than here the Guru explaining to us through the compassion how to become one with the Guru. Even if um, the Bodhisattva Vajrapani were here, the, more, the most powerful of the Bodhisattvas. Even if he were here, what more could he do to free us from our delusions, to free us from our own ego-grasping, self-centeredness, pride, jealousy? What more could he do apart from what we are learning from the Guru Yoga of Jamakinsi Wongo and his activities. But therefore, it is the embodiment of all the Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, and Jushri. To that Guru, the glorious Lord of Scholars, then we are praying. We are supplicating. So that guru, why is this, you know, why do we call this guru glorious guru? Because this glorious guru is able to bring in, fulfill our deepest desire, the desire of this, um, this being that we are, that would like to become
Grimshay, I think the sound, sorry to interrupt, I think the sound might have gone. Your sound is gone. For some reason, the sound is off. Is that better? Yes, that's better. Thank you so much. Okay, did it go off just right now? Just about probably a couple of sentences ago. Okay. Not very long ago. One minute. Okay. So. Glorious Guru. Why do we call him this Guru? Glorious Guru. Because this guru has the ability to fulfill our deepest aspirations, to fulfill the deepest aspirations, deepest devotion that we have towards the guru. Openness through which we can become just like the Guru, so that we can experience everything that is the most glorious, which is to become free from delusion, free from fear, just like the Bodhisattvas and the Buddhas. So that guru is the one that we are supplicating to. We are turning our minds to, training our minds to think of. And so um, in order to, to know of these qualities, it would be so helpful if you could read the biography of Jami Kinzo Ombo. At least it is available in, in English, where you can learn of, um, how he, from the moment he was a yeah, young father, all the way to, you know, until he passed away, how his entire life was about benefiting sentient beings, learning how to benefit sentient beings, showing the path, how to benefit sentient beings. how he studied, how he practiced, and then how he benefited sentient beings. And um, Just going to read a small anecdote. Um, he said that um, When, uh, when the 
when Cham Gung Kong Rinpoche was um, with Kim Tse Wun He stayed at Tsong uh, Sao for some time. And then towards the end of the year, um, when Cham Gung Rinpoche was going uh, to his own place, Cham Kim Tse heard that and then He's, he was um, saying oh, it would be great if he could stay a bit longer because we still have more to do. But I suppose um, he, he had to go back because um, they had to do the end of the year on obstacle removing ceremonies. And then it said that when he said um, somebody like him does not need any of those things. Um, obstacle removing uh, things. Somebody, somebody like Jango Gungjum doesn't need. And then he said, he said to have said this. He said, us, our body, our speech, and mind are at the surface of sentient beings. We dedicate it to all sentient beings. Apart from that, we do not have any single um, desire or activity to engage in. Not even the side, size of a, of a one finger do we actually uh, dedicate to ourselves, like giving ransom, ransoming, life ransoming, etc. And then it said that at one point there was going to be a tremendous um, fight in the in the neighboring place. I suppose warfare, and <clears throat> there was uh, there was some non-human or spirits that were trying to uh, to trigger that kind of fights, that kind of uh, war between people. So Jami Kim Zibongbo dedicated his own life for them. He gave them eight years of his life to that, to, to those uh, lifespan, to that those spirits so that the spirits wouldn't uh, create um become become the the condition for this turmoil for this kind of war battle amongst human beings so every part of his life was given to that and then um, i think many of these you can read in tanking the Wongo's life story And then when somebody asked, um, when some people uh, asked him about uh, giving them in, in introduction um, to their nature of mind, then he said something like, if, if you need to hear it through examples and through words, you, have, you know, you can uh, hear it during the empowerments, the fourth empowerment. More than that, there's not much more to say. But he said, pray, supplicate. I can bless. This is what he has said. There is blessings. I have blessings if you can supplicate. But he says, again, he said, but I don't think that you're able to supplicate. He said again further saying, this is, I think, very helpful for us. He says, even if I am dead, my blessings will not diminish. It will become more powerful. So this is what Amikinswambo has directly said. So we can really take uh, uh, solace in this. 
and that if we can supplicate, there is no doubt blessings in store for us. So it's very easy, just this is a very short Guru Yoga, and this prayer is even shorter. From the depths of my heart, from my heart I pray, grant your blessings. So, and then there is the short uh, name or mantra on our and then also other prayers you can do. Um, you can read also, uh, as I said, the biography, but there's also the very short biographical prayer you can read, or shorter than the, the, the long biography. ตัดมือกันทําสินามันตัดจุดนั้นมีความหมายอยู่ที่เจสอมมันมีความจําเจอตั้งแต่ตัวนั้นมีความสุขที่มีความจำเจอมันมีความจำเจอมันมีความจำ
it will contribute to um, to increasing, to multiplying the blessings, the realizations. So the receiving of the empowerment is also something we we can really benefit from something that we shouldn't neglect, even though it may not be said to, to do that um, many times. There's really no limit, and it's something that we can take our time doing it. And then at the end, the guru dissolves into a ball of light. Five colored light, whatever size, large, small, it can be as large as the entire universe or as small as a mustard seed, enters through the top of our head and dissolves into our heart center. Inseparably. And then, just for a few moments, not being caught in past, present, and future concepts or thoughts, just resting. And then dedicate. I think that's all I can squeeze today. So thank you very much to everyone. Over to the dedication. Um, Please continue uh, <laughs> program. Uh, Ruchala, I think uh, uh, some of the people, they were late uh, to, to the teaching and feel like I would like to request you to give the oral transmission again. <laughs> I'll do that. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's ngorumanzo <laughs> Gombezat 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming to this session and for that wonderful, wonderful teaching and for all of your kindness and blessings on this day. Thank you Thank so you. much, Mr. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>Instagram, TikTok, Google, Facebook. I don't know. Where could we find? <clears throat> um, I think I think to find a teacher, it really depends on <clears throat> developing the, uh, some kind of uh, maturity in oneself, I think, first. Why are we looking for a teacher? First, sometimes the first thing seems to be that I, at least I have a feeling if I were that, sometimes I feel like a, what is it called? A, you know, those people who go to the racehorse to bet and then wanting the Wanting to, wanting the, what is it called? Get the news from the horse's mouth so that we can bet. Um, <clears throat> I have had the fortune of spending some time with my teachers, like Dr. Tinsley Rinpoche, Dr. Kanji Rinpoche, Dr. Tushi Rinpoche, and also with uh, Dr. Tinsley Rinpoche. And more recently, you know, lately, with the Solonist Psychiatrician Machine. When I was mainly spending time with Yavtu Tushin Machine, most of the people who used to come to see him wanted actually um, sort of uh, um, to know whether they could get a visa for the US or not. 
the majority of the people seeking him out were that. And some of the qualities that I would hear of him was, oh, you know, if you take, get some of his blessings and then you go through the border, you don't get checked. Those are the qualities that I saw. So mainly it looks like, you know, we're looking for a soothsayer, somebody who can give us advice on um, whether getting together with this person is going to work out or not or whether um, if I invest in this, is it going to be good or not? I think first we have to find out whether we are that. So what kind of student we are. If we are really, really uh, suffering from suffering of suffering, suffering of change, ready to hear about suffering of change, ready to hear about suffering of compounded nature, then I think we might look for a different kind of teacher. We'll be the, the kind of student that could look for this kind of teacher. So really, first of all, I think I have to see what kind of student I am. I, even though I have spent so much time with these teachers, you know, sometimes these ones are wanting to hear from the horse's mouth. Sometimes I feel like going to get a lottery. Will I get this? Should I ask my teacher, which one should I get? I'm going to go out and buy the lottery. Will I, you know, sh should I get it today or not? Can you please think of me? These things come out. So at that time, I'm not so sure what kind of student I am. There are other moments when I'm really caught in my the turmoil of my own delusions. At that time, I might be asking for a teacher like Tanya Kinzebombo. So I think first we need to really see this, which means that actually we need to learn um, what is it that we actually want. Even there, we have to have aspiration, a genuine aspiration to find a soothsayer to find a teacher who can take me beyond samsara, teacher who can advise me with my, uh, what do you call it, real estate or friends or et cetera, et cetera. I think getting out of that is the biggest thing. So for that, I think we first need to make aspirations that I will want an authentic teacher that will take me beyond this cycle of existence, beyond the eight worldly concerns. If not, then it's different. So I think first we have to make this prayer an aspiration. Pray to all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas that even though at this moment all I want is the eight worldly concerns, may I actually wish to find a teacher that is beyond that. Because otherwise, even when we find such authentic teachers, we end up using them like a, what is it called? Like a book, is it a bookmaker? Is it called a bookie or something like that? What? Bookie. Bookie. End up using them like a bookie. And that is so devastating. But what can we do? That is what we are. So I think that is first, make aspirations that I want, that I really want to be, to, to understand what the Buddha taught and that I actually want that and that in order to get that, may I recognize, may I not only recognize, see a teacher, find a teacher that can guide me beyond that, and that when I see one, may I use them as one. I think that is really where I, I think what I can say about it. And other than that, of course, if you want to see the qualities of the teacher, you can read in any uh, text of Lamrim that explains what they should and shouldn't have, and whether they do or don't have, we have no idea whether they have or don't have them. But at least if I have the wish to seek 
and see within me what is it that I want, then with that aspiration, as Jamie Kinson was saying in the, as I quoted him saying that, if we can pray in that way, then in this life or another life, I am sure teacher like Jamie Kinson will never abandon us like the Buddha, Buddha Rinpoche, will never abandon us. That I have a trust. Mm -hmm. The only thing is I don't trust myself. That's the most difficult thing. Thank you. Was that it? There are a few more questions if you have a little bit of time still. Okay, I have, I'm, I have one more question. One more, okay. Uh, so Rinpoche, you talked about being touched by the blessing of the Guru. Could you talk a little bit about what that means? What What is it about devotion that is so effective in changing our mind? What What is the, Why is devotion doing the trick? Devotion. Well, actually, <clears throat> I think one thing most of us have in common is that we all um, fall in love, <clears throat> whether it's with people or <clears throat> products, we fall in love. You know, um, why do we fall in love? I think that's what I mean by being touched. We allow ourselves to become vulnerable for a pizza, for pasta, for uh, spring rolls, for cars, people, for whatever it is. If I allow myself to be vulnerable to that, to a spring roll, then my mouth naturally opens and the spring roll just magically enters. That is what I mean by being touched not being resistant, being open. I just didn't want to use the word devotion because everyone has an idea of devotion and some of us even have some kind of reticence to use the word devotion. But it just means being, from my point of view, I'm not, I can't say of others, from my point of view, is being desperate enough to want to be free from my own neurosis, from my own delusions, from my own stupidities, from my own pride, jealousy, desperate enough to be open, especially open to my teachers, like, you know, his son is Dr. Tijan just simple thought of them gives me some kind of um, relief. That is what I mean by being touched. Just simply thinking of a face of my t-shirts, thinking of the smile of the Rinpoche, or even just the name of Jami Kinze Wampo. I have the fortune of being touched by them, being vulnerable to their activities. Just that. When I have that, then I don't have this carcass of self-preservation, of pride, or anything like that, because you know my own desperation shows me that, that none of these can protect me against anything. It actually imprisons me. So then thinking of my guru in that way, I don't know whether that's devotion or not, what everybody calls devotion or not, but that makes me open to them. That reduces my uh, pride, arrogance. It makes me able to soak in or put myself in an atmosphere where I can soak in whatever is um, their activity right now just thinking that my some of my teachers are still on this earth 
gives me some kind of relief. And I feel gratitude towards them. Just thinking of them makes me less um, harsh, makes the whole world feel more uh, hopeful. That is, I think, in my opinion, the benefit of devotion. Basically, I'm not, what is it called? I'm not um, protecting myself against Dami Kinzungpa's blessings, my guru's blessings. Okay, thank you very much to all. And thank you, everyone, for allowing me this. And thank you, Dr. Grimbiche, for continuing. Okay, bye bye. Thank you, Rimshe. Thank you so much. Good to see you. Okay. So now you have no choice, Dr. Gurimbache. You have to continue. I think aren't we over the limit? Oh yeah, the time. Domala. Yeah. We we are over time, however, Rimshe, um, if there's perhaps we could do one more one last question that's for Dr. Gurimche. Oh, I'm so dazed right now. Um, I just saw myself on the screen, how, how uh, silly I look with like the big grin all the time. I just not sure if I can even uh, understand questions right now, but if you have. Shall we try? <laughs> um, all right, so I'm going through the list. I have a few questions here. Maybe a, a two very simple one, straightforward. Uh, one is that Rinpoche mentioned that we should, we can visualize ourselves as Vajra Yogini when we practice this uh, Guru Yoga. Uh, do you know what form of Vajra Yogini we should visualize ourselves in? Um, I think I have seen, um, you know. But Naro Vajra Yogini, very similar to that. Just, um, mm, I don't think it really matters so much which form, to be honest. It's more for the tendril mm -hmm. to, to symbolize inseparability. And also, I think it's more like a, what Zong Se Rinpoche says, um, when you have water in your ear, you put more water to take it out. So sort of drawing out um, the blessing, the wisdom of the Guru, you then uh, arise as Vajra Yogini from the depth of your sort of Buddha nature, you know, so maybe I think that's more important than, yeah. Okay, thank you. Then um, another question re uh, relating to uh, having many teachers. So if we, if we follow many teachers, how do we recognize our root teacher? Oh, you should have asked that to uh, Rinpoche. <laughs> uh, the, the concept of root guru, strictly speaking, is someone who gives you, uh, I think, uh, according to Jitin Chakba Jaltsin, who is, you know, not only a great yogi, one of the greatest yogi of Tibet, but also <clears throat> a great scholar. And so basically anyone who gives you Vajrayana teaching, you know, not just initiation, but actual uh, could be a teaching instructions towards whom you have devotion and you received it as such. So that person becomes actually a root guru. Root guru is to differentiate between Vajrayana teacher and uh, other kinds of teacher like sutra, vinaya, uh, you know, for ordinary <clears throat> fields of knowledge. So I think that is that. But over the course of time now, the idea of root of root guru have changed, I believe, in people's mind. And it's like my main guru, you know, the, <laughs> the main guru I supplicate to. So I think that's what they're really asking. Then the question is, 
that really de- i think it's who to whoever you have most devotion to you feel most closest to and you see is most flawless in your own uh, in our own limited perception i suppose that is then our root guru and then everyone else is emanation of this guru just a reflection and uh, just as all the buddhas and bodhisattvas shaktamuni buddha is a reflection of my root guru right for so similarly i think that that's how then we should be practicing or else it will be very strange you will have many root gurus and you're practicing some teachings from some root guru but not the other ones and you feel guilty and that's that's just um a lot of extra dualistic um traps that we actually do not need and it's something to be abandoned mm-hmm. Okay, then we have um, one question relating to the text that Rinpoche gave us the transmission for. Um, The question is basically how often we should practice it, if daily or on special occasions, or do you have any advice on this? Oh, first of all, uh, really, um, I would like to congratulate the translator, Sonamla, for having done, I mean, not just him, then editors and whoever were, involved for really producing such a magnificent work. Uh, it, it's it's really so good. Um, in terms of a translation, I mean, in terms of practice, it's really up to you. I think, uh, <laughs> however, uh, would be good if you could practice it once every day. How many Guru Yoga practices that we do? How many sadhanas we do? We do? But how many have we received it from Jimmy Kinsey Rinpoche, emanation of um, Kinsey Wangpo on anniversary, <laughs> on his anniversary, his Guru Yoga from his, yeah, young seal incarnation. I really think uh, if, if this is something you're just going to let it vanish into time is such a big loss definitely once then on like a, uh, during full moon you know you, you, you must it's really i think uh, yeah and if you could do it every day three times a day that's so good please um, if you do such sadness uh, let me know. I would like to buy you lunch or dinner. <laughs> and maybe one last one. Or should, should we have one last one? One last one. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Christian. That's quite a, an interesting one. Quite. Um, yeah. Um, so apparently Rinpoche, I guess it is uh, relating to Jimmy Kenzie Rinpoche, but I'm not sure it's not specified. Rinpoche advised someone on their dying bed to view the painkiller as the guru. Do you have any thoughts on that? I think that might work very well. Painkiller removes pain. Guru removes suffering. That um, ordinarily we are supposed to view everything as a guru, emanation of guru. One of my teachers said that um, actually we should be able to receive teachings and initiations and blessings and instructions from a dry leaf, you know, but we are so stuck up in our own very limited perception, we just cannot do that. And so we have such a, a due to our merit and due to blessings and compassion of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, uh, we have such a um, perception in front of us, you know, like our root guru, our teacher, someone who is so extremely kind. And we know that also, we also know that they're, you know, equal to the Buddhas or or they are the Buddha, they are completely awakened. And so I think, yeah, it's, it's really good. Anything should be seen as the emanation of the guru to have a even as you bump into a stranger, 
I didn't think, was that, was that emanation of my teacher? Very strange. Like that, that <laughs> I think that kind of, as Rinpoche was saying, when the, being receptive, you know, being open, I think that's, that's what you need. A painkiller for sure. Yeah. That's so thank you. Very much, Rinpoche. Thank you so much for answering those questions and for being here for this session. Um, what an incredible privilege to have Jimmy Kins from Shay Teach as long as he did. It was so wonderful. So thank you, everybody, for coming. Thanks so much for participating. And especially thank you to Dr. Grimshay, of course, firstly, and Christian for helping, and especially to our interpreters who have been working the whole time through this session. Um, to Maria, Inna, Luciana, and Steph, and Ha, and who have I forgotten? Um, somebody else I've forgotten in there. Anyway, to all of the interpreters, thank you so, so much. We really appreciate your help. Thank you to all um, the people who helped from my team to get this event happening. And um, please, everybody, don't forget to visit our reading room where you can see texts like this beautiful Guru Yoga that we published today. Um, and please stay tuned to our social media for future events like this. And thank you all for coming. Thanks, everybody. See you next time. <laughs>